Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. And today we're going to talk about Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book, The Gulag Archipelago. Carl and I both read the abridged, the authorized abridgment. It's uh, by Harper Perennial Modern Classics. Mm -hmm. That's the one we read because we don't have time to read all 7,900 pages or whatever there are, the big one. I have a visual. You can't see it, dear listener, but Scott can see it. So I liberated this book from a monastery gift shop bookshelf. Hmm. Just volume one. Wait a minute. Did you shoplift that? From a... No. I... That's what liberated means. I'm sorry. I bought it for maybe okay. a dollar. So this is volume one, and it is 620 pages of, I'm holding it up so you can see, four-point type. It's microscopic. <laughs> it does have a, a, a index of persons in the back, which is useful, because I there's a lot of names, and Russian names are hard to keep track of. But that's volume one of three. So it's a long, long book. So 620 pages of microtype and then three volumes of it. That's, I don't know, what is that? 2,000 pages, 3,000 pages? Yeah. It's long and it has a weird title. So Gulag and then Archipelago. I remember seeing this book when I was a kid on somebody's bookshelf. I bet it was a book that you bought in the 70s and never read. Where, which, whose bookshelf was it? Do you remember? Oh, heck, it might have been my grandfather's. I'm not real sure. The first time I saw this book was on my uncle's bookshelf. His second wife (laughs) (laughs) bought this book, and I actually think she read it. She had, I remember her bookshelf. She had Executioner's Song, a little mailer on there, Mm -hmm. Um, had this, some uh, John Updike. She was okay. That's pretty good. She uh, She was okay enough for me. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, but not for my uncle. Yeah, he's on number three now. <laughs> well, I don't know. Am I sorry or happy about that? I thought she was hot too. <laughs> I feel us getting distracted. So this is a book that that came out in the early seventies. It was never published in the Soviet Union. I'm not going to claim to be an expert on this. Solzhenitsyn had been well. It's got a weird title. Maybe we talk about the title and then a little bit about the person. Gulag is not a real word. Yeah, those, those Soviets love their acronyms, didn't they? Smirsh. Yeah, death to spies. Yeah. If you've read the James Bond books, you know about Smirsh. And he talks about Smirsh in here. So Gulag, I, I couldn't pronounce the Russian if I saw it, but it is an abbreviation for the name of the prison administration in the Soviet Union. It's like CIA or FBI. It's not a real word. It's just the gulag. And it's come to be a real word to mean a political prison. And there's no real archipelago. Like you can't point to uh, to this on a map. Well, what would an archipelago be? What is that? Is that like a uh, peninsular chain of islands? Yes, I believe that is what it is. I'm making stuff up. I'm I'm not sure about peninsular, but it's a chain of islands. A chain of islands that extends out into whatever. Yeah, so it's a very strange title, Gulag Archipelago. Did they have islands? When I was a kid, I thought it was like a, like uh, James Michener's South Pacific. I thought it mm-hmm. was some kind of set of island tales. Yeah. Because I never read it when I was younger. But uh, the archipelago is the series of disconnected prisons throughout the Soviet Union that nevertheless all share the same culture. Yeah, because those, those 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 prisons are very much insular, like an island would uh, would be. Uh, I want to talk more about the history of the book. This cat was uh, imprisoned for eight years in gulags, and uh, Khrushchev essentially kind of pardoned him and allowed him to be released from the prison. He had he was doing a tenor. That's what they called a ten year sentence, which was pretty much the standard fare for a long time. Um, and he was released on the eighth year of his tenor and was allowed to print a uh, publish a, a novel he call uh, he wrote called One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. And then he got in hot water again and was put in exile and so on and so on. 
But he he ended up writing this book, the Gulag Archipelago. The manuscript had to be hidden and spirited away by dozens or maybe even hundreds of friends. And this book was published uh, in the sort of underground, informal Russian or Soviet press. They call it the Samizdat. You'll see that word, S-A-M-I-Z-D-A-T. You'll see that a lot. Once you've seen it once, you'll see that word more often, uh, where they would mimeograph these things and pass them around. And he said people would often, you, you could have it for 24 hours, and then you had to pass it on. And so people would just stay up day and night and just for 24 or 36 hours in a row and just plow through this thing and then pass it on to their neighbor. So you knew one person who had read it that gave it to you, and then one person that you gave it to, and that's all you knew. The Samizdat Press which was an informal sort of underground movement, was really important in ultimately undoing the Soviet Union. Uh, yeah. I'm, wor- I'm working very hard on creating our own Samistad Press around here, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he had to hide it. Uh, even after Khrushchev, 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 is he's the good guy, if there is a good guy amongst... Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah, he's not so good. Well, I don't know. Like, he's way better than Stalin. You know, he took his loafer off and pounded the podium there at the UN in 62 or whatever it was. We will bury you or whatever. Mm -hmm. But he seemed to be much more liberal than than Stalin and was uh, kind of undoing some of that nastiness of of Stalin's. And at least let Solzhenitsyn publish something. Well, something that said bad things about Stalin. Could you have published things that said bad things about Khrushchev? I don't know, but we'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a thaw and then a refreeze and Solzhenitsyn had to get out of the country. They couldn't kill him because he was a Nobel Prize winner for literature. We're going to read his speech. We're going to talk about his speech in probably three minutes. Set your watch. Fat chance. <laughs> but uh, they, they couldn't kill him. He ended up living in Vermont for 20 years. He went back to the Soviet Union, which I guess is better than Vermont. It was not the Soviet. He went back to Russia. The motherland, dude. Yeah, it's his country. He says somewhere in that Nobel Prize lecture that nations are the treasure of the world. That's an interesting thought. Well, he he wanted to go back to his nation. Mm -hmm. And he did. And um, when did he die? 2008, 2010? Not very long ago. 2008, yeah. So I was diving into the history of this. So this the Gulag Archipelago is not a history book in the modern sense in that he had no access to statistics. Yeah. What is this book? That was my question for you. What the hell is this thing? What the hell is this thing? Well, I have an answer. Good. I like it. I think I I mentioned this to you before. I think this is eternal memory. So Hmm. if you are in one of the churches to the east of the Danube, if you (laughs) partake of a Christian church that's of the east... So you have like all, I think it's all Souls Day in the Roman Catholic Church. I don't know if the Anglicans do that. Mm -hmm. Day after Halloween. Yeah, November 1st. Where you pray for all of the faithful departed. In the Orthodox Church and Eastern Catholic Churches, you do this four times a year. And what you do is you read everybody's name in your parish. If you have a big parish, if you're in the cathedral parish in your city, you're going to be there all day. You read every name of everybody that's died from the church so that people won't forget them. If you go to a funeral, uh, the last song that you sing is eternal memory. So he had been in these camps. This is what I think this is. He had been in these camps and there were all these people whose stories were going to get wiped out. Yeah. Nobody knows. So I was digging into some of the controversy on this book a little bit. Uh, Robert Conquest is a guy that wrote about Soviet repression and millions and millions of people killed. And then there's some other guys. I, I think his name is, uh, I can't remember, Wheatstone. Uh, there's a bit of a controversy. How bad was Stalin? Well, even from the people who say he wasn't that bad, it's still millions. You know? <laughs> yeah. Who, who says, you know, I'm going to spend my academic career just figuring out just how how not bad or how slightly good or what, what, what who does that <laughs> so maybe it wasn't 60 million maybe it was 20 million maybe it wasn't 20 million maybe it was 4 million but it was definitely millions millions definitely millions 
So, uh, but millions of people that you don't know about. And the archives were briefly open in the 90s because, well, there used to be this thing called the Soviet Union and now it's gone. Well, in the aftermath of it being gone, the archives were opened. But they're closed. Again? They're closed. And they were going to be reopened in 2014. They will not be reopened until 2044. So if it wasn't so bad, why are the archives closed? That's my question. So I'm, I'm going to take the word of Solzhenitsyn, who was there, and I'm not going to worry too much about his accounting, whether he got the numbers wrong. You can discount this by 90%, and it's just horrific. Yeah. Yeah, it's still bad. You know, the mass murderer. Well, maybe he didn't kill 100. Maybe he just killed 10. Right. Oh, I guess he's good then. John uh, Wayne Gacy. Maybe he only killed four kids. <sighs> Come on. God, that makes me so Come on. angry. Uh, and so all of these people that he knew that, that went through the camps, uh, you know, somebody gets arrested, vanishes, goes to the camps, freezes on a cold night building a railroad in Siberia. They're left. He's never going to be remembered. He's going to vanish from history to be like he never existed. Well, where did where did Uncle Vanya go? Well, he was arrested in 36. Yeah. And these aren't arrests, by the way. They're kidnappings. Hey, knock, knock, knock. Here's our warrant. What are my charges? You know, that's not like that. It's uh, they're kidnappings. Well, Carl, wait, well, wait a minute. Do we want to go talk about the uh, Nobel Prize uh, letter, or we want to go right into the book? I thought the Nobel Prize winner might lecture might set the stage pretty well, as because you asked what hmm. is this book. I think that might help answer it. Yeah. So he gets notified that his peers have nominated him for the Nobel Prize for literature, and then he ultimately won it. And he was afraid that if he left the Soviet Union to go accept the prize, that they wouldn't let him back in, which is interesting. I would be glad they would let me leave. <laughs> but this is the motherland. You know, this is his country. Yeah. Or that she is, as he says. And, and so he wrote this. he wrote this lengthy letter to accept the uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, and by the way, at the end of this in the book, I see that it's copyrighted by the Nobel Foundation. I'm like, that sucks. <sighs> that yes. sucks. For Solzhenitsyn's own uh, ad authorized abridgment of this, he had to get permission from the Nobel people to publish a letter that he had written. Right. I'm not real keen on those Nobel people. They give Paul Krugman <laughs> Nobel Prizes. <laughs> well, it's all, it's all dynamite money. Right. Nobel was... Uh... An arms dealer. Invented TNT, I think, right? Something like that. Yeah. Can you believe that? Krugman. <laughs> well, anyway, they maybe they got it right with this guy. <laughs> There's rabbit holes, you know, yawning in front of me, and, and I'm trying not to dive down them. So he's got a, a reflection on the nature of art, which I think is interesting and worth talking about. He talks about art as something irrational, something undefinable, something he says on page five, art is not defiled by our efforts. Yeah, I thought I, I thought that Carl would like that because art, art exists outside of our efforts. That's right. This is creeping Platonism. Yeah. He seems to believe that art is a form. But all the irrationality of art, its dazzling turns, its unpredictable discoveries, its shattering influence on human beings, they are too full of magic to be exhausted by this artist's vision of the world, by his artistic conception, or by the work of his unworthy fingers. Yeah, it, it, if for him, art exists outside of this world, uh, but has enormous power in the world. And then to follow up on that, he, he says in part two of this, he quotes uh, Dostoevsky, who said that beauty will save the world. And he says, well, how, how, in the, how are we going to do that? How does that work? Yeah. Uh, and I think he actually makes a good argument for how it might work. Yeah, I really liked it. I, I drew a picture of it. Beauty will save the world. That's, I think, from the book The Idiot, which is a great title. Yeah. Dostoevsky's, or The Fool. Show me this picture. <laughs> I love the pictures. Well, it's just trees. I don't know if you can see it. I see that. Solzhenitsyn talks about the three trees. He w He's trying to figure out this quote, if it's true, how it could be true, that beauty will save the world. A favorite quote of two popes ago, by the way, 
John Paul II really liked that quote. We had a lady that that wanted to join online great books, and she sent an email to support. And she said, you know, I'm like this, and I'm I've got these sorts of views, and so on. And gosh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'm going to fit in there. <laughs> <laughs> and Warsham sent her an email it back. It was, it was great. He says, well, you know, of the seminar host, um, we've got some atheist, a full blown card carrying communist. Nobody knows anything about Hamburg except he's a jerk. And <laughs> and Carl is more Catholic than the Pope. He said, you'll be fine here. <laughs> Where do you get the card to be a card-carrying communist? Is there essential office? He's a registered party member. So just like you can get your voter's registration card for a Democratic, Libertarian, Republican, Green Party. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder what his stance on gulags is. <laughs> I don't know. Let's ask James O'Keefe and Project Veritas about what uh, Bernie's staff in Iowa's. Yeah, I, I usually try to like steer clear of politics just because it turns people off. But, you know, there's a reason this book's important. There's a reason that a few people of note are reading Solzhenitsyn these days. It's because two, two high-ranking uh, members of a candidate's p- staff spoke and said gulags weren't so bad. And, we need to have them back. And we need to have them back. And so, yeah, I mean, is us saying that a political thing to say that? I mean, you can go look and there's surveillance camera and uh, hidden mic footage of these political operatives backing a presidential candidate advocating for the return of gulags. Yeah. So maybe maybe you ought to read about them and figure out what they are. Yeah. Well, back to the beauty thing. We're going to come back to that in a minute. He says um, – when in bloodthirsty history did beauty ever save anyone from anything? A noble, <laughs> uplifted, yes, but whom has it saved? I've kind of felt that way about it as well. But then he goes on, and I think he describes how it does save. Yeah, so he goes to the transcendentals, our old friends, the transcendentals, yeah. truth, goodness, and beauty. And transcendental means... It's transcendent. It's above. Anything that is is also true. Anything that is true is also good. Anything that is good is also beautiful. So truth, beauty, and goodness. It's a wonderful... If I were a better artist, I would paint it. Talking about truth, goodness, and beauty. If the tops of these trees converge, as the scholars maintained, but the two blatant... Two direct stems of truth and goodness are crushed, cut down, not allowed through. Then perhaps the fantastic, unpredictable, unexpected stems of beauty will push through and soar to that very same place. And in so doing, will fulfill the work of all three. When I read that, I realized that what he said is true. (laughs) (laughs) And here's what I meant. Here's what I meant, or here's what I thought when I read that and, and believed that what he said is true. There's something transcendent. And that about uh, beauty that transcends language, it transcends rationality, it transcends so many things. It's such a visceral thing that everyone can recognize. We might have trouble recognizing truth. We might have trouble recognizing goodness. Those things might be hidden from us, but you just can't hide the beautiful. The lowliest among us and the most poisonous among us can see it a mile away. And uh, it's probably the most powerful of those three lights, I think. Yeah, and he thinks it's irrefutable. If it's good art, at the end of my notes, I, my question is, okay, Alexander, what is art? Oh, you gosh. know, art is supposed to partake of truth. I recently read a book uh, by Tom Wolfe called The Painted Word about modern art. Uh, making the claim that modern art was mostly done after the theory was developed. And that it's not really about anything. It's about the theories of the art critics. I'm not sure that art is saving the world. No. It's a different category of thing. Yeah. Which would mean art isn't whatever you want it to be. Which Solzhenitsyn says as well. You know, it's unpredictable. Discoveries. Art is something you discover. You set out to do the painting and you you end up with more than you planned. I'm sure Shakespeare, (laughs) I'm, I'm almost sure Shakespeare didn't think, I mean, he probably knew he was good. But he's just trying to make a buck mm-hmm. in the theater district in London and, you know, came up with more than probably he planned. Yeah, there's no way he thought, well, Hambrick in Oklahoma will be reading Antony and Cleopatra in early 2020. Yeah. I mean, art goes beyond, you know, um, 
we did Beethoven last week. I hope people like that that show. Well, you should like it. Um, <laughs> but Symphony Number no. Three was what we did, and Symphony Number no. Three is going to hit you if you just make a little space for it. And it doesn't matter what the politics of it are, if there are any. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. It's just truth and sound. I'm the guy on this podcast that spins fairy tales and believes in elves and all of that. I, I get that. But good art is something that you can't... Okay, story time. I used to practice music a lot. Okay? I got reasonably competent at the trumpet. I could play most symphonic trumpet stuff. And I studied jazz, too. Studied jazz theory. I know what notes to play. Or let me put it a different way. I know what notes not to play mm -hmm. over a certain set of changes. I put a lot of time and mental effort into that. And if I went to a jam session, you'd listen to me and you'd say, well, he doesn't stink. But I remember I was playing in a jazz band in upstate New York. I was in college there for a year, a grad school. And... Some kid came in, some high school kid. He was 14, I think. He came in, brought his tenor saxophone in, and he played guest solos with us, and he blew us all away. And there was something about him that was great that we didn't have. All of us yep. who intellectually approached this stuff, you know, we're like, so when are you going to go off to New York City? And he says, well, I have to get a driver's license. <laughs> he was too young. Right. You know, you can study art and get good at the technical aspects of it, and it's still, there's something missing. Yeah, there's a filter of the human consciousness that has to decide, has to choose. It has to choose, right? You have your medium, and you can learn all about the medium, but the, the selective reproduction of the vision is where the magic part happens, and I don't, I don't have that piece. Yeah, you can't make the magic happen. You mm -hmm. can prepare the way for the magic. You have to learn how to draw, for example. But that's Carl's experience of art from yeah. having tried to do it. Uh, I couldn't make it happen. I, I got competent, but not great. You know, and, and I, it's frustrating. So then he goes on to describe all kinds of problems that the world has. Uh, he says that we aren't on a, that we all live on these different scales of ethics, he calls it. I don't know how much we want to dig into that. We're already 25 minutes in. But we have to have these different kinds of values and these all different kinds of ethics and that we all need to coordinate those scales and values. You know, I actually kind of agree. Like ethics should be universal. It should apply to every single person. You know, a good, a true ethics should apply from top to bottom. It should apply to the government, to the police, and to the criminal, and to your grandma and everyone. And, uh, regardless of what country they're in as well. And he asks, how are we going to coordinate these value scales so that we can help each other? Because his project is to make sure the gulags don't happen again, right? Uh, and he says, it means we have to do that with art. This is on page 12 of this crawl, in this uh, first paragraph of section five, if you're finding mm -hmm. it somewhere else, look, reader. Propaganda, constraint, scientific proof are all useless. But fortunately, there does exist such a means in our world. That means is art, and that means is literature. He, uh, not only art, but he thinks that literature is the best, most useful way to align everyone's value scales to make sure that nothing like the gulag happens again. He says the only substitute for an experience, he's very interested in the personal experience and uh, trusting your own crooked eyes, he says. Dr. Sullivan says his own lying eyes. <laughs> he says the only substitute for an experience we ourselves have never lived through is art. We have to use this art, particularly literature, to expand the experience of every person so they can see all see the problems so that we can start to uh, align the souls of nations. You know what this made me think of? It made me think of the times when you hated all the poetry in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and I insisted that, no, you have to, you got to read dwarf poetry. You, right. You, you have to be able to be with them in the caves. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how you understand how they feel. Right. Social needs. And the line that I really love, nations are the wealth of mankind. It's collective personalities. Russians are different. Americans are different. English are different. French are different. 
And the way you understand how they are is by reading their stuff. Carl. Yes. I think he's right about so many of these things. Yes. I, I think literature is very important, and I think it's a big old lever we can use to move things with. But what do we do when we are in a post-literate society? And I think we are in a post-literate society, which isn't to say that people are have no letters and can't read. They don't, and they choose not to, and they prefer other art forms and so on. Right? What do we do? I think we're. I think it puts us in grave danger. Yeah. And I wrote down here in the in the margin that I fear digitization. Uh, he talks about violations of freedom in of print. Digitizing these old books uh, opens the door to get rid of them. Oh, we've already destroyed the, we could destroy the hard copy because we've preserved them digitally. And all you have to do is right click delete to get rid of an entire library. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the digitization thing puts us at great risk. It really worries me. Yeah. And that nobody reads it. So the, there's yeah. a danger of, which he talks about later in this lecture, and then we can go talk about some of the horrors of the gulag. You don't remember. You know, you don't remember that you, you think, um, this is page 13 in our edition, that which some nations have already experienced, considered, and rejected is suddenly discovered by others to be the latest word. You have to read this stuff. You could see, look, if you think gulags are a good idea, okay, all right, but they've been tried. You should go read how they worked out. Okay, and then on page 15, He's talking about the duty of the artist to present the truth as much as he can. And he's accusing the artist who doesn't do it. He says, let's assume that the artist does not know, owe anybody anything. Nevertheless, it is painful to see how by retiring into his self-made worlds or the spaces of his subjective whims, he can surrender the real world into the hands of men who are mercenary, if not worthless, if not insane. <laughs> you got to tell the stories. You have to... You have to say, this is what happened. Power is not the end. The things that you're planning to do, well, they have a cost. And here's some stories of some people who lived through it. And the truth of the artistic presentation of what happened can show the lie of the gulag. Oh, gosh. This letter is so good, Carl. Yeah. Section 6. Scientists have not manifested any clear attempt to become an important, independently active force of mankind. Science doesn't, can't tell you anything about what's right and what's wrong. This alignment of values and this, this you know, it, by the way, he talks about alignment of values. He never actually says anything about discovery of what those should be. He doesn't, and that's a, it's a great letter, and I couldn't do it, but that's a little mm -hmm. bit of a hole, and maybe he didn't have sure. time for that. But um, the scientist, scientism is doing nothing to tell us about what's right and what's wrong and how to act. They can tell you what wavelength blue light is, but it has what to do at 4.30 on Tuesday. They don't know. Then he craps on the UN. <laughs> he just calls them out. He's like, they've done nothing. You know, they've got this Declaration of Human Rights, and he says it's one of the greatest uh, documents in, uh, in human history, and they continue to allow the Soviet Union to uh, have a seat at the table at the UN without adhering to it in any way. He calls it a sham, essentially. The United Governments, not the United Nations. Yep. Huh, nations are different than governments, Carl? According to Solzhenitsyn. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. Yes. Who is a United States citizen, but was not born here. And uh, she understands that. The nations and governments are different. Like, she's not an American. She's a United States citizen, full standing, can vote, do anything I can mm -hmm. do. But her people did not partake in the Civil War. Her grandpeople <laughs> didn't drive a single spike in a railroad, didn't till an acre, didn't do a thing. She understands it's different. It was really interesting to hear her talk about that because uh, now we just say, you know, okay, you take the oath and you get your voter's registration card and all that stuff and you're, you know, boom, you're, you're an American. But I, I think they're two different things. It doesn't, mean that, it doesn't mean they're lesser people, but they're two different things. Well, all right, I'm going to stick with Solzhenitsyn. There, he talks about types of people. There are groups of people that behave in particular ways. Uh, and one of the things that Stalin was trying to do was to liquidate 
That's their word. Mm -hmm. The sorts of people that they didn't like. Uh, But he talks about Ukrainians. He talks about Baptists a lot. I didn't know there were so many Baptists in Russia. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't either. Russian Baptist. Do they go to the Southern Baptist Convention? Uh, Nobody should. (laughs) But, you know, there's definitely types. And being a citizen of a country doesn't make you the same as that people. I mean, that's, they had Germans in Russia that they sent off to Siberia. They were Russian citizens. They were Soviet citizens, but they were not the right sort. I have uh, some very, very good friends who live here in Tulsa, and I eat lunch with them every Friday, but they're not Oklahomans. (laughs) (laughs) They're not. They're from the West Coast, and you can tell. And my folks were all here before this was a state. We like came up out of the dirt. We're our own kind of thing. And they're not bad people, but they're not. Like the, we're all formed by the places we live in. How would you become an Oklahoman? You can't do it now. It's too late. You can't just move there and, and like embrace it. I don't think so. And go eat at that cafeteria. It helps. Get the red dirt in your toenails. It helps. Although there's not much red dirt out by you. No, we're not red dirt. It takes years and years and years generations you know to be like deeply acculturated you know he talks about let's talk about the gulags now and his Mm -hmm. the gulag part of the book these russians because they are russian they just don't resist they never resist and they come for them in the night and they tell them to tiptoe down the stairs to not disturb their neighbors and the people who are being abducted tiptoe down the stairs Mm mm-hmm they never raise hell. They were serfs under under the czars for uh, 2,000 years. And they mind. They behave. They do what they're told. Yeah, Solzhenitsyn says the time to resist was the moment that they arrested you. But nobody does. Nobody ever does. They tiptoe quietly out of the building so as to not disturb the neighbor. Can you imagine some... Uh, Loudmouth Italian American chick from New Jersey doing that? <laughs> no. Just screaming and eyes scratching, and or some redneck girl from Stigler, Oklahoma, be throwing beer bottles, and you don't know me, and you know, <laughs> I mean, we're the people. <laughs> you couldn't do that here. I once heard a description of a, a particular kind of American character is that if the government established rules for how to set a proper campfire that the Americans would be the sort that would not follow the rules and burn themselves just to spite the government. Yep. Yeah. It's a different sort. Um, and it, it probably took a long time to get Russians to be the way they are. I remember watching a Russian movie. Uh, this is in the nineties after the thaw, after the fall of the Soviet Union, it won some kind of Oscar. And it was set in the time of Stalin, I think. Uh, it was a little family tale, but there's an older guy who had once been one of the the rich, and they're taking his house. This might be, I might be confusing it with Pasternak, with uh, Dr. Zhivago, but they've taken his house. Which was also a Samus Dot production. Yeah. For the sake of the people. And he's like, I'm the people too. Well, no, some of them aren't the people, okay? So this is a revolution for the sake of the people, but there are some who do not belong and need to be gotten rid of. Where's the the, the quote from 1918 about liquidating the bourgeois as a class? You don't need to be guilty. Oh, yeah, this is on page 21 of our edition. This is from a guy named Latsis. We're not fighting against single individuals. We are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. Bourgeoisie, by the way, is a word that's impossible to spell. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not necessary during the interrogation to look for evidence proving that the accused opposed the Soviets by word or action. It doesn't matter what they did. Are you a certain sort of person? You get arrested. Yep. Chapter one is about arrest. It's about how they would do that. And it's so bad. It's so gruesome. It's so dark. But damn it, he's funny, Carl. (laughs) He is. Didn't you think he was really funny and this about as light as you could be with this? Yeah. This thing just reads like butter. This is so good. Uh, but he talks about the feelings that you have when you're arrested. All kinds of methods. A knock in the middle of the night. 
because they know you're the most confused at your weakest and bleary eyed. Uh, if you're a good worker, if you're a good worker, they would say, oh, you've done so well here. Uh, here is a ticket for a t- for two for a month at this spa. And then you would be so happy for this reward you'd gotten for your hard work. Mm-hmm. And then they would abduct you on the train platform. Or they pretend they're an old, Misha, I haven't seen you for so long. Let's step over here and talk. And, and you're trying to think, do I know this guy? And you don't. But you've been taken out of the crowd so they can quietly get you, get you out of the way. So this is why it's an archipelago. It's not quite known. If you were really determined not to know about it, you could probably not know about it. Yeah, he actually says it's a country of its own. You know, again, like you said, he doesn't have uh, access to statistics. But the way he writes this, I get the impression that at any given time, there were probably 10% of the people within the borders of the Soviet Union were probably in gulags. There's an enormous number of people. Well, all of the public works of the great Soviet industrialization were done by these, by prison labor. Uh, it tells later in the book, I don't know if you got that far, the story of the canal up. It's a canal which is not used because it's not deep enough. Wikipedia says 25,000 dead to make the canal. It's probably higher. Just marched out into the cold in January to dig. You know, because Stalin wants evidence to show the world that they're industrialized. Right. And he'd bring people from the New York Times or or. Bertrand Russell and say, look, everything's good in the Soviet <laughs> Union. Russell. Walter Winchell. No, there's a, I think his name's Walter Durani. There's a guy for the New York Times that uh, still has a Pulitzer Prize uh, for going and telling everybody that everything is wonderful in Stalin's Russia, in Stalin's Soviet Union. He was lying. Look, on page five, during the arrest of the locomotive engineer Enoshin, a tiny coffin stood in his room containing the body of his newly dead child. The jurists, that would be the police, dumped the child's body out of the coffin and searched it. They, sh- they shake sick people out of their sick beds and they unwind bandages to search beneath them. There's nothing they won't do. Uh, he said, uh, Venya Levitsky says, every honest man is sure to go to prison. Right now, my papa is serving time, and when I grow up, they'll put me in, too. And then he says, they put him in when he was 23 years old. They had these blue caps, and he calls them the police that were in charge of abducting people to put in the in the gulags, had quotas. There aren't even charges for a lot of these people. You already mentioned that if you were bourgeoisie, they were coming for you. Um, but, but later on, and he describes later in the, uh, in the sewage disposal system chapter, uh, these successive waves of people that were were pr- imprisoned. We'll talk about those. Uh, but from time to time, uh, local offices would get orders for 200, 400, 500 people, and they would just abduct people to send to prison. Yeah. It's the famous quote by uh, Beria, who is head of the secret police, show me the person, I'll show you the crime. Yep. You know, we'll find a crime for you. The psychology of the arrest is is really interesting. Solzhenitsyn says that he himself, like, he lugged one of the suitcases. He had to give his captors directions. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of those little funny bits. Yeah. <laughs> We're lost. Which way do we go? No, you turn right up at the corner. Yeah, they looted his house and made him carry part of the loot, essentially. Sol- Solzhenitsyn was a captain. I think he was an artillery captain in the uh, Soviet army, and he was fighting the the Nazis. As best I can tell, was a successful military leader and was encircled at one point by the 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 German army uh, his unit was encircled and they imagined to, uh, they imagined they managed to break free and return to the russian fronts and they arrested him mhm yeah he'd sent some letters to his school friend that said not nice things about stalin yeah secret you know they said they would open your letters and if you had wrong thoughts you get arrested and everybody's saying well it why? Why am I being arrested? And if you make a big stink, it'll be worse. So don't make a big stink. Just play nice and they'll they'll let me be. You might be able to generalize a lot out of this psychology of why people will submit to things that are terrible because they don't want to make it worse or they're surprised or shocked. He even talks about the happiness that you would have because they're arresting everybody. Everybody's getting 
depersoned. Oh, yeah, th- so they, they walk around on eggshells all day, every day, for perhaps decades, fearing an arrest. And for some of these people, they knew it was coming. And when they finally are arrested, oh, it's a relief. They don't have to fear it anymore. Yeah, and so what you got arrested for, there was an Article 58. So this would be, Social Needs and Talks about it in Chapter 2. Article 58 of the Soviet Code, Section 10. Uh, this is on page 27, propaganda or agitation containing an appeal for the overthrow, subverting or weakening the Soviet power, and equally the dissemination or preparation or possession of literary materials of similar content. Maybe we should stop doing this podcast. Because we're arguing against the Soviet power? We're in violation of anyone's Article 58 from time to time, (laughs) I think. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I I uh, mean that. Sure. We've already, look, we don't have gulags. We do have Twitter miners. Yep. That go back and look and find something that you did. And then they don't, they currently do not put you in prison. They currently shut all your access off to the internet. It's kind of a digital gulag for wrong think. This Mm -hmm. is part of the reason that I I think this is a good book to read. If you want to understand that it's not going to happen this way, if it happens again, it'll probably happen in a different way. Mm-hmm. But it happened, and you probably ought to read about it, or at least read the abridged version. Or when you start saying that thought is a crime, boy, do you find a lot of criminals. Yep. What are the things about this chapter two? You know, they got this article 58 that they're enforcing where thought is a crime or a communication of certain thoughts or crimes was just how efficient the bureaucracy really was. You know, we have this narrative over here that everything the government does is inefficient and sucks and, you know, and they're bumbling and, you know, whatever, (laughs) you know. But when I was reading this, I thought, golly, these guys are so efficient. They seem to be very, very good at getting people, uh, throwing people in the hole. And then I'm reading metaphysics, Aristotle's metaphysics right now. And I think that when us sort of kind of small government people look at the federal government, we say, oh, they're so inefficient. I think we're misconstruing their final cause. Hmm. You know, the people that work at the DMV, their final cause isn't to make sure you get your automobile tag at a low cost and with little trouble. That's not, that's not what they're there for. That's not what they exist for. I'm not exactly sure what they do exist for, but if for damn sure in serving clients. It's patently obvious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, organizations, I think, generally achieve a final cause pretty well. It just might not be what they tell you it is. Yep. The Soviet police were pretty good at doing what they were doing. Yep. Exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class, getting rid of whole nations of people that were troublesome. Uh, you have the whole list in this chapter. There are people, you know, from the the Western provinces fleeing ahead of the Nazis. Well, when they come flowing in throw them out, throw them in the gulag. Anyone that had been captured by the the German army, throw them in the gulag. Uh Any military forces that had been encircled by the German army, even if they broke through and returned to the lines, throw them in the gulag. Yep. My own particular weird religious sect, those Eastern Catholics, throw them in the gulag. We have martyrs that they killed, painted on the wall of my church that the Soviets killed. They would drag them around their jail cells by their beards, I read in here. Yeah, just a whole list of of undesirable people that it sure would be nice. I mean, this is a way to national unity. You just get rid of everyone that's not nationally unified. Um, And they were pretty good at it. But I don't think their criteria are that organized, though. I I think the whole thing's just a psyop, to just have everybody on eggshells and just terrified Hmm. all the time. From time to time... They would, you know, issue these edicts. We're going to, we're going to destroy yep. this kind of person, the kulaks maybe. But I think it's just psychological warfare. Just keep everyone terrified yeah. constantly. All right. Let me speak for Stalin now. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> I'm going to stretch. Okay. All right. Cause I always ask my, my people in my seminars to be sympathetic. All right. So with all of this having been said, all right, you've heard of world war two, world war one, the sequel. This time it's personal. <laughs> The Allies won. The Allies won because of Stalin and the Russians. If you look at the casualty figures, there's a wonderful YouTube video on it showing just like 
in live graphs with like each dot represents a thousand people. And when they start listing the Soviet casualties, that, that column of dots just keeps going up and up and up and up and up and up. He was able, maybe it was through the fear that he engendered, it made a nation that was capable of withstanding the German invasion and driving all the way to Berlin. Uh, they did it. You can't. The, the whole reason that the Nazis lost in World War II is from the Russians. Yeah, they bled them dry. It was a pretty high price. <laughs> I I don't like the price, but boy, I hate to say this. I hate it, especially for Chapter 6. Chapter 6 really bugs me. But, man, Stalin won that war. Mm -hmm. Could he have won it in a different way? Probably. Probably. That's easy for me to say here for my uh, ergonomic desk chair. And Yeah, I have the same chair. There's a somewhere in here. There's a, a a woman that got sent to the gulag for going into church and praying for the death of Stalin. And social needs. Says, well, how would they know? <laughs> how would they know what she was praying for? Right. Well, they got her anyway. And there's a vignette. This is my one of my favorite horrible stories from this wonderful horrible book. Uh, there was a party conference in the Moscow province, and at the conclusion of the conference, a tribute to Comrade Stalin was called for. Of course, everyone stood up. The hall echoed with stormy applause rising to an ovation. For three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, the stormy applause rising to an ovation continued. Let's read it all. <laughs> but palms were getting sore and raised arms were already aching and the older people were panting from exhaustion. It was becoming insufferably silly, even to those who really adored Stalin. However, who would dare be the first to stop the secretary of the district party committee could have done it. He was standing on the platform, and it was he who had just called for the ovation. But he was a newcomer. He'd taken the place of a man who'd been arrested. He was afraid. After all, NKVD men, that's the secret police, were standing in the hall applauding and watching to see who quit first. You want to keep reading? Sure. Just a paragraph. And in that obscure small hall, unknown to the leader, the applause went on six, seven, eight minutes they were done for. Their goose was cooked. They couldn't stop now until they collapsed with heart attacks. At the rear of the hall, which was crowded, they could, of course, cheat a bit, clap less frequently, less vigorously, not so eagerly, but up there with the presidium, where everyone could see them, the director of the local paper factory, an independent and strong-minded man, goodness, I don't have my glasses on, stood with the presidium, aware of all the falsity and all the impossibility of the situation, he still kept on applauding. Nine minutes. Ten in anguish, he watched the secretary of the district party committee, but the latter dared not stop. Insanity to the last man. With make-believe enthusiasm on their faces, looking at each other with faint hope, the district leaders were just going to go on and on, applauding till they fell where they stood, till they were carried out of the hall on stretchers. And even then, those who were left would not falter. Then, after 11 minutes, the director of the paper factory assumed a businesslike expression and sat down in his seat. And oh, a miracle took place. Where there had been universal, uninhibited, indescribable enthusiasm, it was gone. To a man, everyone else stopped dead and sat down. They'd been saved. The squirrel had been smart enough to jump off as a revolving wheel. And they arrested the guy, and he went away. Yep. I mean, this is a classic story. This is uh, I had heard this story and did not know that it had come from this book. You know, this is an insane test. I don't know if this test had been set up by the NKVD or if it just presented itself and they used it to uh, to find someone who was not 100% obedient. Golly, man, it seems like there are some uh, insane tests of fidelity to weird social pressures nowadays. Well, if you're one of the first to stop applauding, then the bad things happen to you. And like we say, so far it's not gulag, so far it's just Twitter exile. Right. There are things that you are supposed to support, and if you don't, then you are of a class of people that should be liquidated. Yeah, this is not a book of the past. I mean, it's a book about the past, but it's... Once you start to think that wrong think needs to be punished, well, then this is how you do it. Uh, he, he writes another story. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how much exposition of this as literature we're going to do here. Uh, but he tells a story about some, uh, I think there were some Swedes 
I think they were Swedes, maybe they were Finnish people that had, uh, they were soldiers, I believe, and they had been uh, put in gulags and uh, people started asking after them. They had Stalin, I think it had come directly from Stalin. It's on page 33, had them all fattened up, taken out of the gulag, fattened up, haircuts, dressed up, blah, 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 paraded them out in front of the, the press and said, look, man, you know, we're taking care of these people wonderfully. Nothing's wrong, blah, blah, blah. And uh, put them back in the gulag. Everything was political theater over there. Everything was political theater. If you saw it in public, on a public organ, he calls them organs. Mm -hmm. It was probably not. It was probably not true. Yeah, you could look up uh, what Potemkin villages were. Mm -hmm. Just show villages to show the tourists, to show the Western press uh, that everything was great. Boy, this is a hard book. Yep. And by the way, we just read propaganda. The medium is the massage. And I read this. You know, how much do we see in public that's political theater? Most of it? Well, then go back to the Nobel lecture. So the use of art. Why is he writing this book? What is the use of the sorts of things that we read? I mean, a lot of the things that we read are, are a little more theoretical. This is literature giving a voice to people who were going to vanish. Is there a way through the propaganda with... I'm going to say this without defining it. Genuine, true art. Is there a way to make people say the emperor has no clothes? I hope so. Or is it all propaganda? Is it all turtles all the way down? I mean, this is probably propaganda. This isn't like Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. Mm -hmm. He's pulling on our heartstrings here a little bit. Right. He's not trying to uh, put all this in the best light. He's not like these asshole Stalin apologist you were talking about or trying to make him out to be not as bad, you know, but I don't, you know, it's okay. Right. If you're, if you're innocent, you want your attorney to do whatever he can to get the jury to acquit you. He's uh, putting case here before the, the jury that is the world about what happened. Whenever I read book seven of the Republic, that scene where the prisoners are in the cave, they can only see the shadows from the fire behind them, and there are people carrying images in front of the shadows. The people carrying the images are of interest to me. Who's doing it? Why are they doing it? If they're the only people, mm -hmm. you know, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's like, like I, I don't know. I don't know what I am. I mean, uh, but I know I'm, <laughs> I like free speech and lots of it. And part of the reason I like it is to bust up the dominant narrative. <sighs> Somebody needs to make fun of Stalin. Yeah. Like later in the book, I don't know if you got that far. He says, uh, when the Soviets retreated at the beginning of the war in places that became effectively German. And he says, uh, well, we would take down the picture of big mustache and put up the picture of little mustache. Yeah. That's funny. It's funny. <laughs> Somebody needs to call Hitler little mustache and Stalin big mustache. At and least. if you can't do that, Oh. So do you have a do you have a paint do you have a picture, and you just flip it over and it's a little mustache on one side, a big mustache on the other, and they, the the battle fronts move back and forth, and you just flip the thing over. It's yeah. Speaking of busting narratives, Carl, page thirty four. Holy crap! You alluded to this on our FAQ show that we did a couple weeks ago. It is surprising that in the West, where political secrets cannot be kept long, since they inevitably come out in print or are disclosed, the secret of this particular act of betrayal has been very well and carefully kept by British and American governments. In the Sunday Oklahoman, the Oklahoma City newspaper in 1973, mm -hmm. uh, they published an article by Julius Epstein where he described how the British returned Russian nationals to Russia against their will. And in many cases, abused them, beat them. Yeah. The Americans did the same thing. The Americans and the British sent potentially millions of people back to Russia against their will, only to become either deadified or at least political prisoners in the gulags. Yeah, there's a, a scene later in the book, and I looked it up, about uh, the British repatriating Russian nationals and like families jumping off the bridge because they'd rather drown than go home. Uh, I think this is page 108. British tanks and soldiers. The British soldiers started beating them with rifle butts and clubs. 
if you look it up, you, there, I guess there's still a cemetery there. That whole chapter six is heartbreaking to me. Stalin won the war. He really did. And we needed him. We being the British and the Americans. And we made deals. I suppose the Canadians too, whoever else were in the Allies. And we made deals with Stalin to send people back. And we kept those deals. Yep. And sent a bunch of people back. The story of the Vlasov men is uh, interesting to me. I, I would like to find a good book on this. Uh, I'm just going to summarize his story. So Vlasov was the general of the Russian Liberation Army. This was Russians outside of Russia or perhaps who had collaborated with the Germans against the Soviets. Yeah, there are lots of stories of um, people kissing and hugging and celebrating liberation of uh, Ukrainian and Western Russian villages by uh, the Wehrmacht. Yeah, things are not necessarily as simple as Hollywood movies might. No. But towards the end of the war, and I really, I, like, I do want to find a book on this. Towards the end of the war, the Russian Liberation Army is acting as a free agent. They're no longer working with the Germans. And the reason that Prague exists now to go and visit, it's not that the Soviets defended it from the Germans. It was the Russian Liberation Army that defended it from the Germans. They were hoping, apparently, to get sympathy from the West. They didn't get it. Nope. And so they all ended up in the Gulag and Vlasov was killed. And We needed the Soviets to win the war and we gave up a whole bunch of people to them. It's, I get to the end of this. And I, you know, when you read history, you want to have good guys and bad right. guys. And the problem with Solzhenitsyn on World War II is you're looking at it, where are the good guys? Yeah, I'm not sure. Not sure there can be any good ones in war, you know? Chapter 3 is all about interrogation methods. Mm -hmm. The entire time I read Chapter 3, all I could do was think about what would I do? I would fold like a card table. Uh -huh. uh, all the things that you can think about, all the things you've heard about, you know, the uh, sticking stuff under people's fingernails and heads and vices and all that stuff, uh, it, it's sleep deprivation, that's all here, and more, and more. Mm -hmm. It's so gruesome and so complete and so unceasing. These people would be tortured day and night for, I don't know, years. People just utterly crippled and broken by it that would leave the prison system just crippled just crippled, uh, not to mention those that were left just completely insane from the trauma that they had, uh, that they had undergone. So if you got arrested, uh, if you got arrested, it wasn't just that you were going to get arrested, right? You need to be broken. Well, this is interesting on page 43, uh, Carl. Andrea Yenuarievich, I don't know. It's a Russian name. Go check it out. <laughs> Availing himself of the most flexible dialectics, pointed out in a report which became famous in certain circles that it is never possible for mortal men to establish truth, but relative truth only. He then proceeded to a further step, which jurists of the last 2,000 years had not been willing to take, that the truth established by interrogation and trial could not be absolute but only, so to speak, relative. Therefore, when we sign a sentence ordering someone to be shot, we can never be absolutely certain, but only approximately in view of certain hypotheses, and in a certain sense, that we are punishing a guilty person. Thence arose the most practical conclusion, that it was useless to seek absolute evidence, for evidence is always relative, or unchallengeable witnesses, for they can say different things at different times. The proofs of guilt were relative, approximate, and the interrogator could find them even when there was no evidence and no witness. Blah, 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 blah. Confession's the best thing. Mm -hmm. So they didn't even bother with evidence. They didn't even bother with the trial. All they want is the confession. They don't even know what they want you to confess to necessarily. They just need the confession. Here comes the torture. Bad philosophy it takes you to bad places, guys. Mm -hmm. It matters. So I think of uh, stoicism. <laughs> when I read this, stoicism is pretty popular nowadays. Yeah, we need we need to do a show where I just deuce on stoicism for about three hours. <laughs> well, and it's about the the primacy of the this core of the individual, and it doesn't matter what bad things happen to you, 
you can be epic tedious and you can have somebody break your leg and they just say, why are you breaking my leg? You know, very calmly right. and not react to it. The scientific methods of interrogation described in this chapter are designed to leave you no internal core. And they're pretty good. Marcel talked about this in Man Against Mass Society. They're good at it. Yep. It's really hard, really hard to resist. Is there some bit of the self that could withstand all of this? And that, that you're, you're looking at this list of things and saying, I would fold too. Is that a flaw? Is that a moral judgment? Or is it just no I, one could withstand this? I can't see any way out of it. You just immediately say whatever. One of the things that they would do, he, he, he numbers off all these different things. Confusion, persuasion, foul language, humiliation. You know, he numbers them off. Playing on one's affections. That one's the worst. He says uh, a four-sided person was uh, said a man's family are his enemies because uh, here in 1930, Remalis, a woman interrogator, used to threaten, we'll arrest your daughter and lock her in a cell with syphilitics. What a conundrum you're in there. You know, they're threatening to do things to your loved ones. And then if you confess anything significant enough, they're going to round them up anyway. There's no way to resist this stuff. He does tell us a few stories about people who were able to resist having cigarettes put out on them and uh, being kept from sleeping. Or having their testicles crushed or... Yeah, people stomping on your genitals or taking a red hot poker and sticking it in your rectum. They're just, just, just horrific stuff. Uh, forcing a uh, tube down their throat and pumping salt water into them. Putting them in bed bug infested boxes. Starvation beatings. Yeah. So he's got some reflections on this. On page 62, after describing this, he says, and may you be judged by God, but not by people. Yeah. 64, only the man who's renounced everything can win that victory over the interrogator. But how can one turn one's body to stone? Uh, on the last page of the chapter, those who have never gone through the receiving line meat grinder of gulag cannot grasp the true possibilities of interrogation. People can be broken, and there is a scientific way to do it. They'll use it. I mean, why wouldn't they? You know, if thought is a crime and there are people that are undesirable, why would you stop? You say bad philosophy makes for bad decisions. You know, what is a human person? <laughs> Is there anything of value in a human person beyond its place in society? If the answer is no, well, then why not torture them? Right. We're results focused anyway, right? We want to get that canal built. We have to um, meet our quota, our grain quota. We have to uh, prove to the world that the communist revolution can work. What's one man to that? I get worked up over this stuff. Yeah. The next chapter is about the blue caps. These are the people who actually uh, actually carry all this stuff out. And he talks about how when he was around them, he had a firm impression of low, malicious, impious, and possibly muddled people. These are broken people, essentially, that end up in these jobs that put them in position to, to destroy these other people. Uh, they get an enormous amount of power. Uh, if they saw a woman on the street they desired, uh, they could destroy her whole family and take her. Uh, if they wanted to live in your apartment, they could do that. There's very little that they couldn't do. Mm -hmm. He says, um, as the folk saying goes, if you speak for the wolf, speak against him as well. Where did this wolf tribe appear from among our people? Does it really stem from our own roots, our own blood? He says, it is our own. Like These are Russians too. Yeah. These are Russians too. And might you yourself not have become one of them? You know, you but, say you would break for the inter Would you become an interrogator? Gosh, if you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's all easy to say, oh, no, no. But if you're really confronted with uh, perhaps being interrogated or being an interrogator, what do you do? You get more food if you work for them. You get more food. You don't get tortured. Although I think everyone gets arrested eventually or well, potentially could be. Uh, and he says from good to evil is one quaver. Yeah. What if you were an officer and you get the order? What do you do? 
He says on 74, bottom of 74, what do shoulder boards do to a human being? You know, and where have all the exhortations of grandmother standing before an icon gone? You know, if once you're in office, once you've got the job, your aged grandmother praying for your soul, how much effect does that have versus, you know, what your organization is doing and what's going to lead you to prosperity? Uh, I really like the bit about Shakespeare. I didn't like it. I hated it, but I liked it. So, um, yeah, I did this is page 77. Yeah. Uh, Shakespeare's got some villains. He says all of our villains are dumb. <laughs> they're silly villains because they know they're evil. Well, and they don't do very much. They don't do very much. So he talks about Iago. Iago is the guy from Othello that manages to convince Othello to kill his girlfriend. And just for the motives of evil. And Macbeth, you know, he's a piker. He doesn't do much. So this is the paragraph on 77. Macbeth's self-justifications were feeble and his conscience devoured him. Yes, even Yago was a little lamb too. The imagination and the spiritual strength of Shakespeare's evildoer stopped short at a dozen corpses because they had no ideology. Yeah. If you have ideology, you can kill millions. Yeah, just above that, he says, to do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good. Well, to do evil on the on the big scale, it sure helps. Yep. Awful. You know, I, I've been thinking about a problem, Carl. Mm-hmm. People will lie, right? They'll say uh, they'll say something that they know isn't true, and they'll say it for whatever their purposes are. But they'll know what they're saying isn't true. So that's one kind of lie. And there's another one when somebody says something that's not true, but they believe it one hundred percent. I used to think that the person who was lying deliberately was worse. but And you've changed your mind? I've changed my mind. The worst would be the one who convinces himself that it's not a lie? Right. And sometimes they didn't convince themselves. They just believe that something wacky is true. <laughs> well, here, I mean, I, you know, through whatever, what means, right? Maybe, maybe it's a, a belief that they were just sort of handed from childhood, perhaps, you know. Well, how about this? Here's a belief. Okay, everybody has a belief, I'm the good guy. Right. Okay. If you are working for the NKVD and you have done all of this stuff, what are the stakes for you if you have to say, we were not the good guys? What it's, we're doing was wrong. It's an existential problem. Yeah. Much easier to deny the, what's right in front of your eyes and say they were criminals or they had it coming or it was necessary for the revolution or whatever, rather than say, I did evil. Yeah. So the guy that looks you right in the eye and knows it was just horrific and looks you right in the eye and says, oh, yeah, we were right. Okay. That guy's at least wrestling with something in his private time because he knows. And there's a deception that he's trying to carry off between you and him. But, like I said, in his private time, he's got to go deal with it. With the other person, they never deal with it. It would take a spiritual awakening for that person to stop whatever this bad thing is. The other person's much closer to stopping. Mm -hmm. The bald-faced liar is much closer to stopping than the other one. Yeah, the other one needs to completely change the worldview. That never happens. Well, hardly ever. The Nobel lecture that he gave, that he didn't give because he couldn't leave, about the uses of art. Are you going to argue somebody out of the position that he's the good guy and that his people were right to do all they want? Or perhaps if you have a sufficiently compelling work of art hmm. and you show them what happens, something like the gulag... Or the, the novel that he did, that 62 novel, the, I'm halfway through it, the, the Day in the Life of Ivan Den Denisovich. You might be convicted by the truth in the artistic portrayal in a way that the argument wouldn't get to you. So if beauty comes around the side, truth and goodness don't affect you because those trees have been chopped down. But beauty comes around the side and hits you. I'm, I know this is hopeful. This is a surprisingly optimistic book. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> that if I just tell the story, it'll never happen again. Evil doing has a uh, threshold magnitude, Carl. Yes. A human being 
hesitates and bobs back and forth between good and evil all his life. He slips, falls back, clambers up, repents. Things begin to darken again. But just so long as the threshold of evil doing is not crossed, the possibility of returning remains, and he himself is still within reach of our hope. But when, through the density of evil actions, the result either of their own extreme degree or the absoluteness of his power, he suddenly crosses the threshold, he has left humanity behind, and without perhaps the possibility of return. We've got all kinds of sayings that point at that, I think. Sell your soul. Mm -hmm. The deal with the devil. You know, you go too far, and it's you're too far. It's over. That is not a evangelical Christian view, <laughs> but it seems to be true. To, it seems to be true to me. You know, there's a point where people go go too far down, and then what? Awfully hard to come back. There's a lot at stake. If a guy worked for the wore his blue cap for thirty years and abducted twenty thousand people, tortured them, so on and so on and so on. What do you do with that guy? Do you even care? Solzhenitsyn talks about, at least in, he's talking about West Germany. This is 79 to 81. In Germany, they had a denazification. Yep. Where if you were in, if you were the prison guard in Auschwitz, you know, you went to jail, you had a punishment. Uh, n to my knowledge, to his, certainly in 73, whenever he's writing this, it never happened in Russia. I'm still not aware it has. You know, the the Berlin Wall fell in 88 or 89 or whatever it was. And then, you know, the Soviet Union's no longer. I've not heard of anybody rounding up and bringing to justice these people that, that perpetrated this. I've not mm -hmm. heard one of those stories. Mm -mm. Hasn't happened. It's vanishing. Yep. People won't remember it. And the archives will be open in 2044 when everybody's safely dead. And you can talk, I mean, who cares about injustices 150 years ago? Right. That could never happen, right? It, it's safely in the past. You don't need to think about it. It could never be a part of the current political order. It's a way to make this sort of thing dead as a doornail. I have another little chunk I want to read here. Carl. Sure. Top of 79. We've been fortunate enough to live to a time when virtue, although it does not triumph, is nonetheless not always tormented by attack dogs. Beaten down, sickly, virtue has now been allowed to enter in all its tatters and sit in the corner as long as it doesn't raise its voice. However, no one dares say a word about vice. Yes, they did mock virtue, but there was no vice in that. Man, that rings true. Drives me nuts. That's happening here, right now, all the time. Drives me crazy. Give me an example. Flesh it out. Well, we've talked about uh, pop culture and television. How there are there are. I'm not aware of any. I'm not aware of any just heroes and good television. You know, it's all anti heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do stories about people in their and be, being virtuous. You know, in the '50s, we had all this kind of rosy television. Leave it to Beaver, and the and the parents did the right thing, and the boys would mess up, and they would repent, and they would learn how to do it the right way, and everybody was left better. And you know, the Lone Ranger, and um, you know, we we don't have any, we don't have that anymore. Uh, and people make fun of it. They make fun of that '50s television because it's square, and you know, I don't even know. I mean, but they, nobody people says make fun square of it. It's anymore. It's a joke at this point. Yeah, you know, Ozzy and Harriet is a joke at this point. You know, if you wear a sweater vest and your wife uh, wears an A-line skirt and you go to a dinner party, they'll talk, you know, look at Ozzy and Harriet over there. I mean, you know, <laughs> they look nice, but that shit has become a joke now and it's okay for it to be a joke. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, virtue, so he's talking about late 60s, early 70s, whenever he's huddling in his little hideouts writing this book, that I'm li we're living at a time when virtue's not always tormented and beaten down, but it can sit in the corner. Virtue can sit in the corner, but it can't really act. No. Uh, and vice, nobody complains about that. You stopped uh, a, one sentence further. Yes, so and so many millions did get mowed down, but no one was to blame for it. Right. Bad things happened, but they happened. Some people did some things. Yeah, you know, things happened, things were done, but nobody did it. He says, uh, all of these people being rounded up as traitors, how could this be? What state ever had so many traitors? 
Yeah. This is the best state in the world. This is the worker's utopia. This is where everybody's equal. This is built on very high ideals. Why does it have so many traitors? Couldn't said, be that the ideals are wrong. He said something like, well-fed horses don't buck or something like that. Yeah. That sounds like an Oklahoma saying. Yeah, I underlined it. <sighs> what do you make of a book like this? You know, I have a big fear about a book like this. What's the big fear? That it's a fucking how-to manual. For the next time? Yep. That's not to say that it shouldn't be printed, that we shouldn't see it. But if you believe that there are a people who are a, a group of people that are some sort of an existential threat, then you're, if you believe that in your very soul, then it would behoove you to do whatever you could to stop them. And this seems to be pretty effective. Well, it could be read that way. It, if if you, dear listener, wish to set up your own police state, uh, this will be a guide to you and how to do it. But I hope that won't be your reaction. Me too. But are we so naive as to think there aren't people that want to do that? Well, for me, the use of the book. Solzhenitsyn says, we were children of the revolution. He was born in 1919 or 1920, whenever the, the glorious revolution had happened. And they had high ideals in the school. They were taught all this stuff. Did they set out to make this kind of nation? No. Nobody says, Daddy, I want to grow up and be a monster. Nobody does that. And yet it happens. Well, why does it happen? So for me, you talk about metaphysics leading, bad metaphysics leading to bad decisions. And I think that's right. I think bad ethics leads to bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something here that they're missing. If a class of people can be criminal, if thoughts can be crimes, if the individual doesn't matter, then this sort of thing happens. This isn't the only place. I, I'm, I was reading Herodotus with a seminar on Tuesday, reading about Xerxes. Just, you know, he was a tyrant too, um, chopping a guy's kid in half because he wanted to have him home safe from the war. You know, this is nothing new. The scale is. Yeah, the scale, well, 20th century, we, we got scientific about it. More people murdered by their governments in the 20th century than ever. So we, we got real good at it in the 20th century. But what's the missing piece? For me, the missing piece is uh, some kind of view of the dignity of the individual. And I know, I know this is on the borders of religion. I don't know how to justify it. I can't prove it to you. I th still think you ought to believe something like it, that that other individual human is an unrepeatable gem that you shouldn't. He's not expendable. He's not a piece of coal. Mm -hmm. I think if people are parented poorly, that which is special about them isn't isn't shown to them. The appreciation of that isn't shown to them. And they don't recognize that in themselves. And then now anything's possible. Parental abuse and neglect and so on, uh, I think, has an enormous uh, effect in this large-scale violence downstream. Mm -hmm. uh, two loving parents that love you and treasure you and let you know that and not only not only say it to you but act in that way show you that there is something special about you and if you have siblings they can see that that's the same about them uh, you also see that that is special about your parents the fact that they care and you start to then then you know it all starts with the family and then it can radi radiate out from there but if that has been lost in the in the child rearing you know, you're just, you're just creating animals and monsters. Mm -hmm. They don't even know that about themselves. Don't at me. <laughs> I think you have to get almost a little mystical about this. Humans are something special. I don't know how to prove that to you. I think if I'm going to go with Solzhenitsyn, perhaps art can reveal it to you and show you examples of it. Uh, my daughter loves Victor Hugo. Le Mis is a fantastic novel. There's no bad guys in that novel. Yeah. I mean, there's Jean Valjean, and then there's the people that fight him, but none of the people are particularly horrible. In other words, you can sympathize with all of them. You can see 
uh, Hugo has that line that the historian doesn't seek to judge but to understand, which I underlined. And oh, it, I'm all about the judging. <laughs> Well, it depends what how you're judging, you know, if you're judging as in there's two, co- I think there's at least two kinds. There's the kind which says you're a worthless person. We're going to get rid of you. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'd say that's probably bad. If it's, you know, Bubba, you need to get your squad up to 300 and you're not, you're screwing up. You know, that's a a kind of a judgment, but that's a judgment that's based on the value of this person that you see, but that the person you're talking to doesn't. Right. You know, I remember you said once uh, on the that other podcast, the Barbara Logic podcast, hey, I love you more than you do, I, which I believed. I have encountered people, I've had employees that uh, worked for me in a former life who uh, were bright interesting, capable people who didn't do well for themselves in any way, <laughs> really. And I would talk to them about their personal finance and try to be helpful. And and I would find by and by that I cared more than they did because they wouldn't make any changes. They wouldn't do better. And, and look, you know, these people don't have to take my advice, you know, to show me that they care about themselves. Mm-hmm. But you could just see that, that I had more concern and spent more time thinking about their situation than they did. And and that's what I meant when I said that. And I've said that to other people too. And sometimes they don't like it. Well, not, not, they never like it, but sometimes it means something to them and they don't, it'll kind of rattle them and they'll come around. But I, I have come, I mean, I've got to go back to the parenting thing. If some strange guy that's their barbell coach cares more about their physical being than they do, how could that possibly be? They were never taught to care about themselves in the first yeah. place. And I, if they can't care about themselves, they damn sure ain't going to care about you or anybody else. This phrase is running through my head right now. Can you be a Stalin to yourself? Can you be a big mustache? <laughs> well, you're growing a big mustache I right am now. Trying. I think you should curl the ends of it. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. No, I mean, I think that there are people who are self-destructive people that are sort of totalitarianly self-destructive of themselves. They drive themselves to comply with some unreasonable standard of conduct and are very harsh with themselves. But, you know, to be completely a Stalin to yourself, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, let me see if I, cause it's just a phrase that came to mind. So I would say Stalin had his goal, industrialization. Let's read him charitably to make his nation a great power which he did, but had, I would say, no appreciation or very little appreciation for the value of the nation itself. Mm. And so you sacrifice all sorts of bits of yourself, like millions of people, for the sake of that goal. And I think that's a mistake. I don't think he ended well. I don't think he was happy. Do you know he was in the... He was a a seminarian in the Orthodox church. Hmm. Can you imagine having him, him as your parish priest? That's an alternate reality. That would be interesting to write. You know, I was just looking here about his, uh, his father was an alcoholic, abusive. I think that's the key. Uh, you know, you said it verges on religious or something like that earlier. You know, talking about you know, showing, uh, having people see the preciousness of the individual human being or, mm-hmm. I think so, but I think it comes from the parenting. And if you don't have that, you know, if both your parents put cigarettes out on you at every turn, yeah. degrade, devalue, and hurt, harm you, you know, we're set up for a disaster. This is going to be a left turn to our conversation, but I t- did I tell you about my reaction to George Jones? No. I was never much of a George Jones fan. Yeah, me neither. And I'd heard about in you know, his many marriages, several to the same person. I can't quit you. You know, that's like George Jones, whatever. And then I was watching that Ken Burns documentary. I got all the way through it and learned a bit of the story. And he's like, his dad was was the alcoholic who put cigarettes out on him, would take him to the train station, have him sing, force him to sing Mm -hmm. for pennies, steal all the money from him. You know, and then I'm thinking, George, poor George. (laughs) I guess you turned out pretty well. Right. You know, a lot more sympathetic to him, knowing the the difficulty that he had. 
he could have been a whole lot worse. So I think what you're saying is true. I think um, if it, it might be, nobody can demonstrate the value of the individual to you. It needs to be revealed to you. It needs to be shown to you. If you have trouble in your childhood, it's going to be awfully hard for you to see. Yeah. Yep. That sense of self is installed in people um, at a very, very young age. And if the parents don't do that and destroy it, actively destroy it, there's no way they'll recognize the self in others. The, the, you know, the otherness of the other person. Ayn Rand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she says, before you say, I love you, you have to be able to say I. Yeah. And mean it. And I, I think, I think that's it. And I think it comes from the parents. Yeah. This book is gross, but I'll tell you what, as nasty as it all is and as dark as everything in this book is, man, it's really, it's about as fun to read as it could possibly be. Yeah, you know, he's sarcastic and funny and self-reflective. I mean, he, he's got a chapter later in the book where he talks about, uh, it's called The Ascent, the spiritual benefits that he got from being in prison. So this is on page 313. He says, I nourished my soul there, and I say without hesitation, bless you prison for having been in my life. And in parentheses, and from beyond the grave, Comer replies, it's very well for you to say that when you've come out of it alive. Yeah. I think that's a little funny. It's sad, but it's, <laughs> he he's looking at, yeah, I, I came out with a much better spiritual well-being than I had going in. But, you know, all those people died. He doesn't make all these long, long arguments that you have to read like in one sit. This could be a bathroom book. Yeah, it could actually. You know, you read a, a page here, a pa- another page, another page, you know, just little chunks. Uh, a waiting room book, you know, you carry mm-hmm. with you in your purse or whatever, and you just read a little chunk when you got four yeah. minutes. Like, it, it, you don't have to have big, long sittings to get to uh, uh, come to terms with this book. It's just, it's just a, I mean, of course, this is the abridgment, maybe the 2100 page, you know, opus or whatever is, isn't like that, but uh, the Gulag Archipelago, an experiment in literary, literary investigation, the authorized abridgment here reads great. I think everybody needs to read it. Why are kids reading Lord of the Flies and not the first hundred pages of this? Anybody that can read Lord of the Flies has the horsepower to read this. An eighth grader, seventh grader can read this just as easily as they could get that chunk. Why are they reading that piece of shit, Carl? <laughs> because the teachers like that book. I don't know. I, I hated that book, Lord of the Flies. Everything's propaganda. I hate that book. I've read it once in my life. Hated it. They don't want the kids to think the school's a gulag. You go there and it's all cast concrete. They're ringing these bells. They got metal detectors at the front door now. You got to get, you know, a clear backpack, you know, so. We play this game when we're driving. We did it on our drive out to (laughs) Missouri. Schooler prison. Yeah, schooler prison. (laughs) And (laughs) we we do. (laughs) Sometimes you can't tell. No, I know. You, you know, we stopped at that. Uh, we stopped at that Walmart there in Missouri with you guys. You know, and we, you know, we were both in cars. You know, mm-hmm. and we drove by a thing, and we're at school or prison, and it was a juvenile detention center, and we thought it was a like a Votech, like a county Votech uh-huh. school. Yeah, juvenile detention center. Schools are minimal, sec- minimum security facilities with release programs, like they can go home at night. Well, we both homeschool, so dear listener, you know kind of what we feel about this uh i think your kid if i think if you have your kid and you love your kid and there are books in your house (laughs) and there's not very much television in your house they'll probably turn out okay yeah i think so it can't be worse they can't waste their whole day if 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 you just don't give them mind-numbing crap and you have good stuff in the house eventually they'll just open it out of boredom right my dad says you just starve a dog, he'll eat turnips. <laughs> you get those kids bored enough, they'll read the gulag archipelago. Yeah. I'm glad we read it. I'm actually gonna finish this. You know, a lot of the things that we read, um that we read selections from, I really don't have time to finish and, and move on from them. Uh but I'll finish this. It like I said, I can read this in little chunks. It may take me it may take me another year of filling in between all the other things, but that's okay. I can do that. Uh, and it's worth it. Yep. I'm going to dig into a few of his novels. Uh, What are we going to read next? You know, I knew you were going to ask that, and I don't have a prepared answer for you. What do you want to read next? Well, I want to cover some metaphysics because I'm having to read it anyway. You could do that. We could also do um, 
Aristotle and Friendship. Aristotle and Friendship is like book 10 of ethics. Uh, it's not book 10, but it's it's like two books of two books of Nick and McCain ethics. That would be I think that'd be useful and lighter. Lighter. <laughs> this one's a bit heavy. You're the only person that's ever said that. Aristotle will be a breath of fresh air, a barrel of laughs after Solzhenitsyn. Yeah, I think that's true. Let's do that. We'll read uh, Nick and McKeon Ethics on Friendship. I think Tom Wolfe's The Painted Word might be fun. That's short. On art. Okay. You want to do that one? Well, I'm just throwing books out there. Let's do it. Done. You're... I put it in the schedule. It's Uh-oh. done. No, that one's for next week. Good thing I already read it. I know. Now I just have to find it. I know. What else are you reading, Carl? Uh, I'm reading a Walt Longmire mystery. That's the mysteries that you hate because there's like a wolf shaman in it. And you're like, this is not Sherlock Holmes. Some space operas. I like space marines, spaceships and aliens. And yeah, that's good. Plucky heroines. And then just trying to, to keep up with the seminars. This is a, I think I said this before, this is the most intellectually active period of my life. And I taught in colleges for a long, long time. But I've got to keep ahead of these people at Online Great Books. And I got to do the podcast. And so <laughs> I'm reading and thinking all the time, a whole lot more yep. than I ever did before. Got to finish reading the metaphysics. I got to do a close read. You know, I'm writing all the reader's notes and all that stuff for that. <laughs> People are watching is what I'm mm-hmm. saying. It's, right. uh, that one, that one's that that's slow and pretty stressful. My home book group has started Montaigne's essays and there's endless fuel of our podcast in that darn thing. Mm -hmm. so good he's the original blogger just hot takes all all the time (laughs) he gets up in the morning it's like what am i angry about and then just write three pages just the smartest stuff you ever saw (laughs) he's awesome he's awesome okay well we'll hit tom wolf's the painted word where he talks about uh art criticism right yeah you want to get a little walden or something after that carl sure let's read walden so that's two weeks from now. I guess I better order it. I've got a copy somewhere, but it's, it's so good. And then uh, you keep threatening me with uh, continental philosophers. Yeah. I think you're just all talk, bro. Uh, okay. Well, I'll dig up some Heidegger for you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. it's not all bad. There's some stuff that he wrote later on something I know that's of interest to you, which is technology in the human person yeah yeah very interesting to me oh yeah that'll be fun pick out some heidegger and then uh we'll read walden here in a couple weeks when i wrote the following pages or that rather the bulk of them i lived alone in the woods a mile from any neighbor in a house which i had built for myself on the shore of walden pond in concord massachusetts and earned my living by the labor of my hands only a mile away that's so far yeah not really I know. It's just the, the shrinking of the world is what yeah. I'm talking about. A mile away is nothing. That's a great opening line, I think. Yeah. I do. It's I think good. it's a great opening line. Just right, It just gets right in it. All right. Well, there's another Online Great Books podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. This show is growing enormously. And I have to assume that's because you guys are telling other people about it. And I appreciate that very much. If you haven't told a friend about our show, send an episode to them that they would not like. Um, (laughs) And I think that's the best way to get their interest up, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But pass it on. We had a guy on the uh, Slack channel say that he was yelling at us as he listened. Yeah. It's like, good. Okay. I yell at the books all the time. Yeah, it's definitely. good. You could yell back at us. That's fine. You don't have to agree. Yeah. Yeah, tell somebody about the show and uh, go leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or iHeartRadio or TuneIn Radio or Google Play or wherever you get your pod and uh, help us pass on the word. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun and I, I really appreciate all the support and uh, what must be referrals that are happening yep. because we ain't buying ads. Uh, anything else, Uncle Carl? Uh, thanks for spending your leisure with us. Yeah. Yeah. Go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast and uh, let us know you're out there. And we will talk to you in one more week when we will talk about Tom Wolfe's book, The Painted Word. Mm-hmm.